Let's be honest, evolution is awesome. I started reading Improbable Destinies, Fate, Chance and the Future of Evolution by Jonathan Lossos, and I am utterly fascinated. So I am thrilled to welcome Florian Hattich on the show. Florian is a professor of theoretical ecology at the University of Regensburg, Germany. His research concentrates on theory, computer simulations, statistical methods, and machine learning in ecology and evolution, of course. He is also interested in open science and open software development, so he maintains, among other projects, the R packages Dharma and Bayesian tools. Among other things, we talked about approximate Bayesian computation, best practices when building models, and the big pain points that remain in the Bayesian pipeline. Most importantly, Florian's main hobbies are whitewater kayaking, snowboarding, badminton, and playing the guitar. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 54, recorded November 24, 2021, which, by the way, is my mom's birthday, so if you could all send her a message, that would be great. Thank you very much. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. florian hartish or hartig for the daredevils welcome to learning bayesian statistics yeah thanks it's uh, great to be on the show and also thank you for being a long time listeners listener that's i love hosting listeners on the show that's great to hear that a lot of people find find the show useful and uh, i'm sure that you are blabbing about the show all the time to all your friends and family especially during christmas time as it's coming very I soon do, of course yeah so perfect thank you that's the perfect marketing for the show <laughs> so thanks a lot as usual you should do a lot of things so i'm really excited about this episode but as usual we'll go into your Marvel origin story. So can you tell us who you are, Florian, and how did you end up actually on this very podcast and in the stat world? Because originally you come from physics, right? So can you tell us more about that? Yes, exactly. So we just discussed it. So it was a long way to come to stats and to Bayesian stats uh, in general. So originally I studied physics. I did my undergraduate in Berlin and then a master in theoretical physics in Uppsala, Sweden, on some obscure subfield of theoretical quantum field theory. And then for pretty random reasons, I moved to Leipzig and started a PhD in an ecological modeling group. So what they were called officially was environmental system analysis. So that means a group that was mostly doing computer simulations of ecological systems. And I did my PhD on understanding the responses of land users to certain environmental policies. So it was actually more in economics or eco econo economic ecological interface. From then I moved into a postdoc that was on modeling tropical forest ecosystems. 
This is where the connection to data started. So when you have these complex computer simulations, at some point you're wondering, how can we get the right parameters for these models? What are the uncertainties of the parameters? How can we formalize, uh, formally couple them to data? And you have to see at this point in the group, and I would say that was pretty common for the field in general, calibrating models didn't mean uh, frequentist calibrations. It just meant that a PhD student was sitting there for a few weeks, trying out different parameters and seeing what would work out with the model. Of course, there's some ideas, some prior information about the parameters. So some parameters are really physical, but some parameters are hard to define. And so people were just turning the knobs hmm. and see what was going on. And I think at this time in the, in the group of PhD students with whom I, I did my PhD together, we had different discussions, we had reading clubs, we were reading books. And so in this group, the idea of statistics was more alien, I would say, than maybe in a, in a typical group because we were mainly process-based, but uh, several people were moving into the statistical direction. We were reading various stats books. There was this discussion of R versus Python in the group, what is better at that time. And I remember that at some point, uh, someone brought this paper of Marcel van Ooyen, 2005. So this is from nowadays, from the point of view of nowadays, this is a pretty standard Bayesian analysis. So in this paper, Marcel showed that you can take a process-based forest model and you can define some priors, define a likelihood, and then explore the parameter space of this model and get the posterior for the model parameters. When you say a forest model, it's not a random forest, right? It's, it's a proper forest, right? Oh, no, no, no. It's really like a forest model where you model the leaves, you model the photosynthesis. So these are really process-based, physical, semi-physical models, I would say. Yeah. And um, so from viewed from today, it's a pretty standard application. So he had a hand-coded Metropolis Hastings sampler and he was exploring the parameter space, calculating the posterior. But from our viewpoint, it was a pretty big step from just hand tuning the parameters to having a possibility to really exhaustively explore the parameter space. I said, wow, this is what I want to do. And when I then started my postdoc on these tropical forest models, I really went into MCMC sampling, trying to calibrate these models. And from there also into these questions of simulation-based inference or so approximate Bayesian computation and synthetic likelihood, because that is something interesting for these ecological models, which are typically stochastic and where you could generate approximate likelihoods from that. So actually you are talking like you started your Bayesian work basically with uh, inference for models where the, the likelihood was quite intractable, right? If I if I understood correctly, and then I, I guess you you, you looked at uh, at likelihood free inference or simulation based inference, as we also call it. So I guess stuff like approximate Bayesian computation, stuff like that. Yes, exactly. Well, it's both. So these models are always stochastic. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to get the exact likelihood for these models, that would be intractable. But what many people are doing is just that they simulate the model 10 or 20 times so that they get a good mean and then take a standard likelihood around it. But indeed, I then also moved into actually using the stochasticity of the model to get an exact likelihood for the model and work with ABC and also synthetic likelihood. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I really should, should do an episode actually about these kinds of methods because there is not a lot of um, resources out there about them, but I think they are that they can be super helpful. Not to myself, should do an episode about that. Listeners, by the way, if you know any guest that would be great for an episode about likelihood free inference and simulation based inference, let me know. Maybe let's talk a bit about that actually. So can you briefly explain to people what that means to have a likelihood free model or like an intractable likelihood when that can happen and then how does ABC or any other method related to that 
solve that problem so that maybe listeners who hear that and don't know about those method, methods are like, interesting, that's the problem I'm having. I should probably look into that. Yes, yeah. sure. So imagine you have a forest model, but you have a similar situations arising, for example, in evolution, often when you look at phylogenies. So when you model a forest, sometimes trees randomly die. Right. So this is what we implement in the model. So there's always stochastic processes, mm -hmm. then there's growth and anything. And so when you look at the emerging tree distribution, it's stochastic. So you know there must be a certain, so if you have an observation, you know there must be a certain probability of making these observations given your model and your current parameters, but you can't express it analytically because this model is a massive thing with 100,000 lines of code and a lot of if statements. So there's no way to calculate this probability analytically. But what you can do is you can simulate from this model. Mm -hmm. And so you could run a million or more simulations and try to get an approximate density of any given observation. Okay, so like doing forward sampling. So you, you simulate yeah, forward sampling. Yeah, exactly. You simulate yeah, predictive take, samples take, from the model. Exactly. So you take the parameter fixed and you just simulate the data. And now you have to try to approximate the likelihood. And there's two main methods. One is approximate Bayesian computation, where you don't directly try to approximate this density, what you do is you put your simulation inside an MCMC or inside rejection sampling and you jump if the probability is close or you accept if the simulated data looks similar to the observed data. Hmm. And you can show that by that you approximate the true posterior and you're getting closer and closer the, the smaller you take your acceptance criterion, which is usually called epsilon. The other method is synthetic likelihood. There you try to, you, you simulate from your model and you're fitting a parametric distribution to the simulations to approximate the likelihood at the point of the observed data. Okay, that sounds fun. And what, are you still working on this kind of stuff or is this something you did at the beginning of your career and now have moved on? Yeah, I'm still working a little bit on it. I mean, in general, the problem with these methods is that they're really, really slow. Hmm. So they need a lot of calculations. Yeah. And that is prohibitive for many of the things I'm currently doing. But I'm still interested in likelihood free inference. And we're currently also additionally exploring uh, the possibilities of deep learning for this likelihood free inference in some areas of uh, so. So when you're trying to compare simulated and observed data, it's of course the question of how you compare. There's the possibility also to use deep learning methods for that for more complicated data types. Okay, but here, <laughs> then I guess you need even more computing power, right? Like because you've got a lot of data and you need to do a lot of simulations. Yeah, but you need to do a lot of simulations anyway. So yeah. my, my rule of thumb is always that for ABC, you, you need around 10 to 100 times more simulations than for a normal analytical likelihood mm -hmm. and the number of simulations you need or the complexity of the space by which you compare observed data and simulated data increases with the number of parameters that you want to have mm -hmm. and that you want to calibrate. So you need a lot of simulations anyway. And this has been a little bit the reason why I've moved out of this field because it turned out that for many of the things we're doing, this is just computationally prohibitive. And we have already enough problems to similar uh, to calibrate the models mm. with normal MCMCs. I see. Yeah. But I think it's a super interesting field and I, I absolutely encourage you to do an episode on it. Yeah, I wanna when I do that. I couldn't invite back Osvaldo Martin. I, I know he he works also on SMC. Like he he's one of the people developing the SMC sampler in, in PyMC. But uh, we'll see, we'll see. You see, I'm already into the weeds, but let's zoom out a bit. And I want to ask you, like, actually, how would you define what you're doing nowadays? I mean, we're not a stats group, so we are an ecology group. And uh, maybe the best way I would define it, it's just computational ecology. So we're using simulation, statistics, machine learning to answer questions in ecology and evolution. And we mostly publish in ecology journals and only rarely in statistics journals. Okay. So it's, it's fairly domain specific what I'm doing. I see. But I do develop some general software packages that mm. could be used and that are used for any type of research. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Look at that. 
Look at that teasing you're doing. You could you could have your own podcast for him. You are a born storyteller. And so you would define yourself as someone who does statistical ecology or something like that. Yes, exactly. Okay. I see. Yeah, I love how that like that cross pollinization, you know, of stats coming into into some of those fields. I think if I were doing research, that's the kind of job I, I would be doing. Like um the border between stats and the application that you're interested in. I just, I, I, I love that. Yeah, so to go back to your origins, I'm wondering, as I ask every guest, if you remember when you first got introduced to Bay Bayesian stats and why they were attractive to you. Yes, yeah, so I think it was really this question about the... Um the model calibration that I told you. So I guess I'm a little bit unusual. I guess your normal guests study statistics. And so they started to be introduced to frequentist statistics. And then at some point they discovered Bayesian statistics. For me, it was the other way around. I came from the simulation models and I first discovered Bayesian statistics. And only later then I was introduced to the basic, to the standard applied statistical uh, problem. So yeah, for me, it was really this problem of model calibration that got me interested in Bayesian statistics, this prospect of really exploring the parameter space of these models, of mapping the uncertainty. And that got me interested in, in Bayesian statistics in general. At some point with a group of friends, we started this Bayesian summer school where we're teaching people standard Bayesian statistics. So I think we started with open box and then moved to JAX. And now we're contemplating to move to Stan <laughs> uh, with, the, with the teaching material. Some pretty vintage classes here. Yes. And uh, so for a while, I was basically the Bayesian statistician. And then I kind of rediscovered or discovered the frequentist world. And at the moment, I think I'm... I'm doing everything depending on the purpose of the modeling. It's true that you're kind of an outlier in the in the sense that you discovered patient stats before classic stats. But I'm not surprised because you come from physics and like physics has like historically been very tied to, to Bayesian stats. So yeah, in a way, that's the natural way for you to, to come to stats in a sense. It's the historic way as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Should get all inspired by, by physics. <laughs> and from that, actually, I'd like to talk about one of your packages now, because from this first foray into Bayesian stats, you actually developed the Bayesian tools R package. And so can you tell us what it is and when it is useful? From when I started to calibrate these models, I was going more and more into helping other people to calibrate ecological models. We had a cost action, or several, two cost actions actually at the time. These cost actions are EU projects that give you money for networking with other people. Mm -hmm. And the main cost action that we had pro found was on better understanding the uncertainty of forest model projections under climate change. So in this cost action, we are trying to teach people. So we are running several summer schools and trying to teach, teach people how to calibrate their models to data. And what we realized at some point was that hand coding the MCMC algorithms, letting people do anything by hand was not efficient anymore. So with a few other people that were the initial developers of the Bayesian tools package, we're trying to pull together all the code that we are using at this point and put it into an R package hmm. so that it's wrapped for people, that is better documented, and that I could use it to calibrate the ecological models. And so what's the difference of Bayesian tools to other MCMC samplers that are available, such as JAX, Stan, or PyMCMC? Uh, Pi so Bayesian tools is a really a package that has samplers that are that are optimized for what I call black box likelihoods. Okay. That means that if you calibrate a process-based ecological model, usually this is a black box. So it's written in C++ or Fortran. You cannot look into it. And so you cannot make use of the, of the techniques that are used in many of the popular uh, packages for statistical Bayesian methods or for statistical models such as Jack Sten, where you specify the model in a way that the sampler is aware of the structure 
of the model and can use this knowledge to sample efficiently, hmm. for example, with Hamilton Monte Carlo or Gibbs sampling with conditional conjugacy. So Bayesian Tools implements several sampling algorithms, but the main working horse is the different, uh, differential evolution. MCMC sampler. So it's an MCMC sampler that has that takes some ideas from genetic algorithms. And the main property is that it doesn't need a gradients of the likelihood or posterior to sample. So it can work on this uh, black box likelihoods. Yeah, so I see why that came out of your first work into ecological models. <laughs> That's basically what we were talking about before. That sounds fun. And I'm wondering also why you thought you had to create it. So in other words, I'm wondering what does your creating this package say about the main challenges in the field? Yeah, I mean, as I said, we created it because we realized if people code this stuff for themselves, hmm. they make too many mistakes. Yeah. But yeah, what does it say is, of course, I think for all statistical software that there is this tension between on the one hand, if people would code it themselves, they would really understand the assumptions. And on the other hand, it takes too much time and they make too many mistakes. So I think in the end, this is what uh, every software developer is struggling with. Um, how do you make sure that people still understand what they're doing? But I think for me in the end, I think there's no alternative. We need, we need good software that is stable, that is tested, uh, so that people can go on and do what they actually want to do, which is to get results and get uh, scientific inference from the data. That makes me think about the Blackjacks project that Remy Luff is spearheading. That's on the Python side. And so the goal here is to come up with common MCMC samplers or common samplers, period, that people can then use in their work. So like, for instance, if, I knew, if I'm working on a project and it's saying I, I need an HMC sampler, I don't have to recode it from scratch because as you say, then I'm alone working on that and that's much more probable that I, that I will make mistakes. Well, then I can just go to Blackjacks and use the Blackjacks HMC sampler, nuts sampler in my model out of the box and just plug that into my model. And that's really the idea of Blackjacks. And I'll refer people to, I think, episode 44 with Rémi Louf, where, where we talk about that. Because that, that does sound a lot like, like what you're talking about, like basically trying to harness the power of uh, open source development so that people don't have to bother with that kind of development for which they neither have the time nor the interest. Yeah, though I think it's still a question at which level of abstraction you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say Bayesian Tools is still a little bit more formalized. So there's a formalized way to specify your likelihood and your prior. And we don't give the user that much freedom in changing the samplers. There would be maybe other projects also in the R environment that give the user more freedom that basically just have, thinking for example of the Nimble project in R hmm. uh, where users can really modify the samplers. And yeah, I think it's an important design criterion how much freedom, how much do you offer predefined and how much freedom do you give people to choose stuff. I think there's no optimal way to do it, but I think on in general, most users are very happy if they get something that works out of the box and that leaves fewer decisions to themselves, even though that might not, may not be optimal for really learning what's behind that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. is exactly my, my experience too with, uh, with open source development. Where do you draw that line between like, giving people something that you can they can just use out of the box without making decisions, which they love because making decisions, especially for beginners, generates a lot of, anxi of anxiety. So they just love when they can just have an automatic solution. But as you say, it's not always the best case. And sometimes you really want people to, to think about it. So always, always the trade-off. And so to go back a bit to the Bayesian Tools package, I'm wondering, like in general, how Bayesian is that field of uh, statistical e ecology? Yeah, I think it depends on what you mean by the field. I would say the, the narrow field of people that are doing statistical ecology are pretty Bayesian. Hmm. Uh, so there's a lot of Bayesians in this field. 
So ecology is an interesting field for statisticians because there's such a wealth of different data types and data structures and problem. Ecological data is very heterogeneous and very complex. And the typical ecologist, I would say, just wants to get an answer from their data. Hmm. So they're not really into this philosophical debate about yeah. Bayesian versus frequentist. Yeah, they don't uh, care. They just want that. to fit their models and get an answer. And I think this is the state of the field. Also in ecology, the discussion about p-values, I'm not sure if it hasn't arri arisen or it hasn't really arrived here in the same way that it has in psychology, uh, reproducibility and all of that. So I think people are mostly concerned with being able to fit any model to their data. The data structures are often pretty complex, requiring um, complex models and hierarchical models are pretty common and therefore also Bayesian stats are pretty common and you usually don't have a problem with using that uh, when you write a paper and, hmm. and put it into review. Hmm, that's nice. Yeah, that's usually my yardstick of uh, understanding whether a field is Bayesian or not is how difficult is it for you to find co-authors and how difficult is it for you to publish a paper, I guess, from what you're saying. You get the occasional reviewer that is skeptical of the priors and yeah. asking you to do a prior sensitivity analysis and all this. But Which can be useful, I mean. Yeah, exactly. But I think people are not hostile against Bayesian statistics. Yeah, geez, awesome. Great. Um, now let's turn to to another package of yours, which is the Dharma package, D-H-A-R-M-A-A. -A -A. And I will put all the links into in, in the show notes, of course, as usual. And this package, you told me, is used by a much broader audience, uh, Bayesian tools. So now, uh, well, how did this one, how did this package come to life and what does it do? Um, yes. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with the success of Dharma. Hmm. So I have to back up a little bit. After this postdoc in Leipzig, I moved into the group of Carsten Dormann in Freiburg. And this is a more classical biometry group, so an ecological statistics group. And one of the things, well, apart from the fact that I had to do more teaching, uh, standard statistics as well, one of the things that we ha were doing in this group that is that we were in charge of the statistics advice for the faculty. Mm. So I got a lot of PhD students coming to my office and asking for help with very applied questions usually. And so the most common analysis tool in this field are probably GLMMs. So people are doing regression models, they have a lot of random effects and they want to analyze their data. And so the students were always in my office and asking, okay, but is this now the right model? Does it work? Is it adequate? And all this. And one of the answers I was typically giving was this idea that I knew from Bayesian statistics is that you could take your fitted model and create basically posterior predictive simulations. So you simulate new data mm -hmm. from the fitted model and you somehow compare your simulated data to the observed data. And if it looks similar in some sense, I will come to what that means, <laughs> then you would say, well, it, this is an adequate model. Mm. So I always propose that they should simulate from their models and it's possible to do this from many models in the R environment. They have a simulate function also the frequentist models. Hmm. So you can uh, create simulations from the fitted model, but the, mm, the frequentist would call this the parametric bootstrap when you See? simulate yeah. from the maximum likelihood estimate. But uh, the point was that most students just couldn't do this. They didn't understand what they would do. It just was over their abilities to program. And so at some point I said, okay, uh, I sat down for a few days and said, I will program this now into an R package. So what Dharma is doing, it takes the fitted model, mm -hmm. Bayesian, but mostly frequentist models. Main users of Dharma, I think, are frequentist modelers. And so Dharma supports many of the standard regression packages in R. And so it takes the fitted models and it creates simulations from the fitted models. And then from this simulation, it calculates various statistics to compare if the fitted model or if you would, uh, so basically calculates p-values to see if the observed data is compatible with the, with the data that is simulated under the fitted model. Mm. And so you can compare these simulated data by yeah, general summary statistics, but the main workhorse in Dharma are really this, what's called randomized quantile residuals. 
And what that means is you take for, for any observation that you have, you're looking at the distribution of the simulated data under the fitted model, and then you're looking at which quantile your observed data lies. Okay. And when you think about this, this quantile is basically a p-value. And so you know that if you define residuals in this way, so you're looking at these quantiles as residuals, you know that it should, because they're p-values, if the fitted model is correct, this is your null hypothesis, the p-values should be uniformly distributed. Mm. And so this is the main advantage of these residuals, regardless of what your model looks like, regardless of which distribution you have taken. It can be have several levels of hierarchy, it can have weird things in the model, if you define the residuals in this way, they will be always uniform. Hmm. And then you can plot them, look at them and test for deviations from uniformity. Yeah, and so what Dharma is really doing is therefore offering a pipeline to calculate residuals for hierarchical generalized linear models. Hmm. And as I said, it's pretty widely used by now yeah. in the R field. Okay, I see. That's basically the, the idea of post predictive checks, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, but in, in, the, in, in a more frequentist setting with the p-value, I see. And also that makes me think, do you know about the uh, rank plots in the, in the Bayesian setting or not? Uh, no. Okay, so yeah, it's a pretty new kind of plot. Michael Betancourt talked about it in, in one of his case studies. And basically, I think it was introduced by Aki Vettari, Andrew Gelman, basically the stand team, Dan Simpson, Paul Bjorkner, etc., in a paper in, in 2019. And that's basically an improved R hat for assessing convergence of MCMC. And it's doing a rank normalization and basically you plot the rank order statistics of the chains. And so that's super hard to explain in a podcast, of course. So I'm really glad I talked about that. <laughs> but now that I've started, I have to finish. So basically you've got your four chains, for instance, and the goal is if your model has converged correctly, you've got this histogram of the ordered samples of the chains, if I remember correctly. And the goal is that the histogram is uniform, more or less, you know, mm -hmm. it's distributed uniformly. And so mm -hmm. if you have this histogram uniformly distributed, then that probably means that your model doesn't have any convergence issue. And so that makes me think a bit of, about what you're saying, because okay, you're yeah, talking, talking about uniform distribution of p-values. Yeah, it's, it might be a very similar idea for a different purpose, of course, right? Yeah. Because if you're checking for uh, MCMC chain convergence, it's not the same of having an adequate model. But maybe the idea is similar, that you're trying to transform everything to uniformity, and then you check from there if this uniformity assumptions are satisfied. Yeah, so I, I think you will be interested in, in that and, and probably listeners. So I put the link to the paper, uh, the original paper in the in the resource to this episode and also the link to the page on Arvis. So the, the package I'm also uh, in the dev team. Uh, we have that um, that plot in there, uh, which is arvis.plotrank. And you, you can go on, the, on that page and see what a a plot rank looks like, which is we, which will be much easier than than me trying to describe that on a podcast. So thanks for for explaining Dharma and what that rings to me is well, more generally, Dharma is part of the the analysis pipeline or the Bayesian analysis pipeline. So that's convergence of the model, then checking your model, then criticizing your model. So I'm wondering, how do you think Dharma helps with that pipeline? Well, I mean, it checks, of course, the validity of your model assumptions. And I think this is a problem. As I said, Dharma is mainly used by frequentists, but it can equally be used by Bayesians. So it has an option just to read in posterior simulations from any software. And then you can do all these plots. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's absolutely crucial to do this kind of checks. I think in some way, it's a little bit an open debate in Bayesian statistics to what extent you should do this. And I have 
had contact with Bayesians that feel a little bit uneasy with this because what you are doing is basically hypothesis tests, right? Mm -hmm. You're taking your, your current model as the null hypothesis and you see if it can be rejected. And if it's rejected from the data, you would move to another model. And there's certainly Bayesians that are saying this is a very un-Bayesian way to go about the, the process of model building. If you would consider other models, you should define all the space of your possible models in the first place, put proper priors on it, and then you don't need to do any model checking. And I think because of this uneasiness with with rejecting models, maybe, or maybe it's just because there were no methods for it. Uh, my experience is that Bayesians do less model checking and are less concerned about model checking than frequentists, maybe. So I feel it is really part of the standard pipeline that you learn when you, you do an introductory stats course in the frequentist world, that you look at your residuals and you do all these tests on the residuals. That's something Bayesians do less. And I can understand the the philosophical argument why you wouldn't do it. But I think in practice, for people that are really doing these Bayesian models in practice, it's absolutely crucial to check your models, to check for dispersion problems and all of the stuff that comes up frequently in, in GLMMs. Because if you don't do it, basically, if you have your wrong model and you don't notice, you can make, make big mistakes in the inference. So I think it's an, an in, it should be an integral part of the, the modeling pipeline. I'm not sure patients don't, don't do model checking. I wouldn't say that. From my experience, they do a lot, but it's, it's less based on test statistics. So something I notice very often is people coming from the frequency stats world and just being kind of obsessed with test statistics and so, okay, but how do I, like, basically, how do I get a magic number? Like often it's, it's that. How do I know that my model is okay? And how do I automate that choice, basically? So how do I not make the decision that my model is okay, but is there some test somewhere or magic number that will tell me, no, it's okay, don't worry, your model is good. I'm caricaturing a bit, but that's basically what I, what I see is that, and that's related to, I told about before, which is this kind of anxiety that comes up, especially when you start patient stats, which is, okay, you've got a lot of power here because you can custom a lot of things, but that also means you have a lot of decisions to make and be overwhelming and also quite anxiety inducing when you come from a framework where the goal is to automate as much as possible that decision making process. So I would say that, and that's usually what I say to people who ask me that it's perfectly fine to look at the, at your patient p-value, to look at the error hat, to look at the RMSE, et cetera, but look at, the, look at everything, look at the posterior predictive checks, do some model comparison with Lou, uh, compute uh, test statistics for sure. And even better, try to come up with a custom test statistic. So, I mean, if the F statistic, for instance, here works for you, so that's great. Use that on your posterior samples. But if another test statistic is better and more custom to your use case, then try and use that one and cut it up. And second, don't only use that. So like look look at the different distribution of diagnostics that you have. And from there, if you have a lot of red alerts, then that, that's a problem. But not one, not any one thing will tell you that the model is right or wrong. That's not really possible. And I don't think that's ever going to be possible because a model is always multidimensional and the, st and the diagnostics are there to test one part of your model. I agree with that. And yeah, but maybe it helps to tell a little bit about my experience with Dharma, which also supports what you're saying. So I get a lot of questions, emails and uh, on GitHub <laughs> from users of Dharma with their residual patterns. Yeah. And so when I initially programmed Dharma, I was just displaying the residuals without any formal significance tests on the deviations of the residuals. And one of the problems I had then was that people, so let's say you have 20 or 30 observations and you have uniformly distributed residuals and you just think you, you sample uniformly from this 30 points, you often seem to think that there are patterns in there. 
<laughs> so I got a lot of people telling me, oh, I think I have a problem here with my residual patterns. And I said, like, are you sure this is not just random? And they said, yeah, but you see a pattern here. <laughs> and this was in the end why I introduced the um, formal check. So now I fit quantile regressions with mm. p-values on the residuals to see whether there's any significant pattern in the residuals. Uh, so I think this helps people if they have low data. But now I have the other problem if I have a lot, if people have a lot of data, these quantiles are nearly inevitably significant. And now I have to explain that, well, if you have a lot of data, but it's just a, it's a really minor, minor deviation of your model assumptions, it's not a problem. So it's this kind of, and I haven't really found a good way of guiding people into yeah, interpreting their residuals between these problems of one, being sure that it's not noise, and two, once you know it's not noise, you shouldn't look at the p-values anymore and you should really look at your effect sizes. So I think p-values are a good thing to be sure that it's not noise. But once you're sure there is something, you shouldn't look at the p-values anymore. You should really look at the effect sizes. And, and many people are concerned about their residual checks just because they're significant. Even though when you think about effect sizes of dispersion problems and all this, uh, these effect sizes are really, really low. And an experienced modeler will tell you it's not really a problem. But I think some kind of guidance is usually important to avoid that people interpret noise. That is my experience from the interactions with the Dharma users. These topics are super interesting. And clearly, I, <laughs> I understand that. And that resonates with, uh, with also my own experience and also teaching some, some workshops for PMC Labs. It's like, yeah, we often get that, that kind of question and of questions. And that's always great for me to hear because kind of like you, I basically started starts with stats with Bayesian stats. And so I don't really have that experience of, um, you know, uh, like being conditioned about p values and, and f statistics and ANOVAs and so on. And, and so often I discover stuff when people ask me questions about that. They're like, Oh, okay. So that's how people do that. Usually <laughs> they, they don't do the, the, the way we do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's super eye opening, actually, because it also helps you first better understand the method uh, you're using and so you, you became a better teacher thanks to that but also it, it also helps you un understand better where people are coming from and what are the difficulties they they could have understanding that framework that is very new in their mind so a question that pops up in my head then was how did you train yourself to be that kind of uh, you know stats advisor that you seem to be because you like you've done physics and theoretical physics, so I don't know how how heavy the stats training is in that curriculum. But yeah, then how did you like ramp up on, on that? No, I didn't. We didn't have a lot of stats and physics, uh, to be honest. I think it's mostly self-learned. I mean, I took a few courses as well later as a PhD student and after that. But it's mostly really self-learned. What what I can say what really helped me a lot, what shaped at least my view on statistics is the interaction, the advice for people that doing applied problems. Because I have the feeling in this lens, many of the philosophical discussions sometimes fade and you realize it's more about practical problems. Yeah. How do you choose your model structure? How do you clean your data? Uh, these are really often the problems that make the difference in the analysis and that really this practical view really shaped my my view on what the problems of statistics are, I think, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, I see. How was this experience of self-learning for you? Because you did that during kind of during your PhD and just after. How was that experience? Like, did you enjoy that or were you quite overwhelmed, at least at the beginning? And wondering whether you should even do that? No, I never remember. I mean, it depends on what you do, what you mean by self-learning. We, When I did my PhD, as I said, we had a lot of journal clubs that were just organized by the PhD students. And I, I, realized, I, I remember that we read, for example, pretty famous stats books in ecology, The Ecological Detective. Mm -hmm. And then we read Models and Data with R by Ben Balker. And um, I think I always enjoyed this more hands-on approach where you where you try to figure out the stuff yourself. 
and you're not presented presented kind of a ready-made view, but you have to explore it yourself and then of course read up because you cannot invent everything everything yourself. But uh, this kind of journal club atmosphere where you're trying to figure stuff out together and someone asks questions and you search for the solution is I think I prefer this over being presented everything by one lecturer because it's a more more active learning I see. and i think this is what i this is how i learned a lot then later just with workshops discussing stuff with people also teaching is something where i think you learn a lot because you have to you have to think about how you explain stuff and maybe ask other people if you if you don't find the solution or read up on stuff and this is basically how it worked for me. I'm not saying it's optimal, but um, it worked for me. That resonates with me too. That's how I like doing my learning, my learning too. Although at, at the beginning you have to do a lot of reading <laughs> from my experience. And then that kind of active learning steps in and it's also more, just more comfortable and agreeable because you get to talk with people and experience the moments where you are completely lost and everybody is and then you're like oh okay so that's probably normal that i'm lost too <laughs> no, stuff like that which is yes really and i guess healthy. at some point you have to do this anyway right because in, if you're going to the more advanced stats areas that's just no good i would say for most stuff there is no good courses or books that would really teach you everything. So you have to think about it yourself, read up on the papers and code. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and then you just have to, like in, in my experience, uh, finding a project where I get to use the kind of model, for instance, that I want to dig into is just incredibly helpful. Yeah, this is also a great point. Yeah, I think also that's something that was is always very helpful to students mm. to actually apply the stuff in a project. I have the feeling often they learn a lot more than if you do the if you tell them everything, and if you if you just tell them the stuff, they will listen and they will think, okay, makes sense, and then forget again. <laughs> but if they have to figure it out themselves in a project, that really reinforces the learning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's my experience too. It's just that being forced to try and figure out what the hell is going wrong with your model and all those divergences is, is super helpful. Uh, but that's where having a community around you is super important because uh, figuring that all by yourself is possible, but takes much longer and is also a bit more draining psychologically. And so having the community around you where you can ask questions and, and be sure that people are not going to boss you around or make fun of you because you're asking silly questions and I'm doing air quotes around silly, but that that's silly on my part because it's a podcast. But yeah, anyways, you get the point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, let's get back on the on track because I uh, time is flying by and I still have uh, some questions for you. And I'm wondering more generally, what are the best practices that you would advise people to use when they are building models? I think it's one of the most difficult question. Yeah. I, have, I would argue statistics is a little bit in the same situation that we are in the philosophy of science where you have Popper and it's saying, you know, these hypotheses that pop out of empty space and once we have them, we test them and it's a little bit like this in statistics, right? So everything we prove, everything we know is like given the model, assuming that we have the right model we can do all this inference. But of course, all our inference is conditional on having found the right statistical model. And uh, so how do you how do you get this model? That is kind of the difficult question. And uh, it's what I feel students in the courses are struggling most with them. And, and I as a teacher, I'm kind of struggling with a point of view that I with a problem that I can't really give them a good uh, step by step point of how to arrive at the right model. I can just say in general, what I do when I teach is that I first of all tell them you have to distinguish for what purpose you're building models. And I usually distinguish exploratory inference, including causal inference or confirmatory analysis and predictive model building. And I think your strategies should be really different depending on what you want to do. So when you want to get predictive models, you will typically think more strongly about automatic model selection or regularization and all this. And if you're thinking about inference, you have to 
you have to think more strongly about causality and uh, these kind of problems, at least when you work with observational data. And I think a lack of thinking about causality, about confounders, colliders, and all of this is one of the main obstacles for people getting correct conclusions from observational data. So this is usually how I approach it. So I think you have to use these kind of, first of all, get, get an idea about what you want to achieve, what your purpose is, then think about these problems. If you're, if you're working in science, you're usually concerned with causality. So you have to get the causal structure right. And then you have to adjust your model to the data. This is the purpose of the residual checks, for example, that you find the right distributions or that you realize if you have a dispersion problem, which would affect your uncertainties and all this. And yeah, this is, would be my best advice. But I agree that it's a really complicated topic. And I think it's really confusing for people in statistics because they, I mean, they would like to go to a statistician and say, here's my data, please tell me what the right model is then you always have to say, I can't tell you, it depends on what you want to know and what your, what your prior knowledge about the system is as well. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, I mean, also, it's also a topic of infinite possibilities, right? It's just that like you can have infinitely many models for a given set of data. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's just like, that is really overwhelming and you need kind of a framework to think about that. But again, not a framework which is rigid and where you cannot, like, you know, not think outside of it, but a framework where you get some suggestions, but you have to think about it and you're not automatically accepting them. So yeah, that's incredibly complicated. I guess it helps at least to be very aware that all your inference is conditional on the assumptions you make and that you always make these assumptions. Mm -hmm. I think this is already an important step, but it's also difficult to teach and maybe at some point also very depressing for people that say like, now I've collected my data and I just want an answer from the statistics. Yeah. And you tell them, we can't give you a definite answer. We just can't, I can give you a conditional answer. Yeah. And that is, I think, important to learn, but it's not what people expect from stats. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's like, it's as if they were coming to you with a practical question and you're coming up with a conceptual answer. Is your life? Because you could answer like something actually we talked about in episodes 50 and 51 with David Spiegelhalter and, and Aubrey Clayton, which is what is even probability? Like it's just like logical reasoning, actually. And so what you're asking me about is like a definitive answer to that problem, but without having to go through that logical reasoning. But I cannot give you that. That I mean, probability is not that. Probability is logical reasoning. So you have to think about that. <laughs> so, but I think if you answer yeah, that, yeah, but it's of course a problem to make this reasoning. I think to defend these people, it's a problem to make this reasoning if you have not very much to reason on, right? So I think many of the people that come to the statistics advice, they yeah. have a complex data set and they don't have good prior on the, on the structure or the causal relationships in this data. And so they're basically just, here's my data, what can I say from this? And it is then a depressing answer to give that say, well, if you don't know what the causal directions here are, I can't tell you. And this is not what people want to hear. And uh, it's this tension that we're kind of operating on. But I think it's also, it should be, maybe statistics should look more at this problem and try to see if we can do more learning from data directly without having to make prior assumptions. In some sense, this is something that the machine learning field is doing just for predictive modeling, of course. But it's kind of their aim, at least, I think, to learn from the data alone. And I think we, although I agree it will always be fundamentally difficult, I think the aim as such is a good one because it is a problem that people have in practice. Mm. And we should offer some solutions to this problem and not just tell them, well, I, can, I could help you if you know what, what your structure is exactly, but as long as you don't tell me what the right model is, I cannot give you an answer. This is, this is not the problem people have when they, when they do a data analysis. Hmm. Yeah, although, well, I think Aubrey would answer that it's just, for some problems, it's just ma mathematically impossible to just have the data and infer from 
from then, the structure. That's the basic plot of his book, if you want. Because here, what you're describing is just frequency statistics, basically. Like, um, just inferring only from the data without prior knowledge. That works sometimes, but for a lot of questions, it doesn't work. But also the frequentists have the, I mean, also their inference depends on the structural assumptions. I mean, I, I think they have the same problem. I would maybe to a lesser degree because you, you, I mean, you're rejecting the null hypothesis and then you believe the alternative is true, but this rejection is again conditional on a number of assumptions that you have to make. So I do not think that frequentists really have a solution to that. So most of the people that come into my office and say, I would, I would like to know which model I should choose and which distribution and which variables should be included, they, they're frequentists, but they have the same problem. Okay, that's a super deep topic, but like we don't we don't have time for that. I could I could go on with that for for hours, but unfortunately um, we're short on time, and I will refer people to episodes fifty and fifty one, and and also probably I'll do other episodes on on that topic because it's just uh, both very interesting and very important. But I will also tell that I think the project that Akivetari and Paul Pioknar especially are working on, which is the software assisted. A Bayesian workflow is very interesting in that regard because that kind of tries to navigate the, this trade-off between automating decision making and nudging people. I really love that that project because that could be something that bridges that gap where the computer is there to tell you, oh, are you sure you want to use a normal likelihood because you've got count data, so maybe you should look into a binomial, etc. Stuff like that, stuff that the the computers are much better than us to do because they have a better memory. <laughs> but then you still retain your creativity and uh, logical and critical reasoning as a modeler, which is what we do much better than computers. And so I think this, this is really a, an interesting compromise and something to, to follow up on. And if people are interested in that episode 35 with Paul Birkner, we talked about that. And then the episode with Aki, I think it's 31, but you'll have to check. I have time for a few questions with you still, and then we'll go to the last two questions. So basically, and I, I merged two questions that I wanted to ask you, but we talked about those mistakes that you see people make, especially beginners or non-stats researchers. So I'm wondering if you can talk about those main mistakes and related to that, what you think are still the big pain points in the Bayesian analysis pipeline? So in other words, the, the points where you think the open source community should focus on and improve? Yeah, tricky question. So I think, I mean, it's, it's of course a general point that people often don't understand how to use the methods mm -hmm. that they're using and how to interpret them correctly. So this is a... This is kind of an easy point to make about the, the mistakes. But I would say in my field, at least, I feel the biggest problem is a lack of causal thinking. Hmm. So I feel that people, people are building their models and they speak about correlations or associations. But at some point in the paper that switches and the correlation becomes suggestive of causality, hmm. And this is all done in a situation where most of the people are really not well aware of these concepts of causality, Perl, and all this. Mm. And I think uh, we mostly work with observational data, and there I would think uh, causality is the main is the main problem to think properly about confounding structures and all this and correct them. Uh, properly hmm, about see. the pipeline, but but here, pipeline. like I'm interacting you, but here you see that the causality is not in the data, right? Like so, here you cannot really have proper inference without the causality structure, from what you say. Yeah, people of course try to do this uh, to have this automatic causal discovery algorithms, but uh, they don't work very well. Clearly, yeah. So it's in the assumptions, but I I, I still think. In many cases, there is prior knowledge on the causal directions, but people don't use this prior knowledge because they're not even aware that they should, because they haven't heard about causality. Basically, the idea is you put all your variables into a multiple regression yeah. and or you do a, some kind of model selection on it, but you don't think about the causal structure. Mm -hmm. And there is this knowledge that you should 
consider the causal direction and that dictates also consider your initial question and that dictates which variables should go in and out uh, and maybe that there's a possibility to run structural equation models and all this this isn't very widespread in my field and i feel that this is the biggest source of misinterpretation because if you if you don't if people just basically have random covariates in and out depending on what they just measured in the study it means that for for certain estimates everyone will get a different uh, a different number just because the confounders are differently corrected for in different studies yeah and i think this is um, a big problem definitely i get i have the same experience it's it's kind of often an, an unknown unknown of practitioners so yeah go ahead with the the rest of my question i i stopped you so. about the pipeline so causality is one part but i think uh, about the pipeline I mean, there's many points about the analysis pipeline and uh, people have to beware if you have the Bayesian pipeline. There was this nice paper by, I'm not sure if Andrew Gelman was the first author or the last author, but there was this paper on the um, the Bayesian pipeline. I'm not sure if you read it a year yeah. ago or so. I was going through the, that had this, the Bayesian workflow exactly and they have this ex entire workflow and they, they're mapping out very nicely all these different aspects. And of course, you can make mistakes in every part of your workflow. And also, I think the Bayesian workflow in general is yeah, not very organized. So it's not that you have everything in one software package and it supports everything of all that you have to, you, you have to take the different packages together. You have to be aware of how they work. So I think this could, um, definitely be supported better and I think people are working on this but I would say more generally if I think about statistics more generally I think one of the problems we have in the pipeline is that uh, that methods are usually developed for a particular isolated aspect so linear regression is developed for people just doing a linear regression but when you think about the entire workflow, it's usually much larger. And in ecology, for example, uh, it's very common that people run an AIC model selection and then follow up with a linear regression. And the problem with this is that the linear regression doesn't know about the AIC model selection that was done prior to that. As a consequence of this, for example, p-values that are calculated in the subsequent linear regression are wrong because they don't correct for the the model selection that was done before and so this is sometimes what i this is maybe what i s often see in applied ecological analysis as a problem that the different methods are not aware of the fact that they're used in a larger pipeline and there's very few people that are looking at the entire pipeline of the analysis process so you have these isolated methods that work fine in isolation. But if you put them together, um, there may certain, maybe certain problems that arise. And there's, there's of course, research on it. People, the statisticians, uh, statisticians, stay aware of these problems. But from the software developing side, the methods somehow don't interface. And so it would be ideal if you would, I mean, you could do this if you would do an AIC model selection before, and then you could give this information that you did it to your regression package. The regression package corrects the p-values. But this kind of integration doesn't exist. And I think it's a big obstacle for, for users. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I love that point with the whole holistic uh, Bayesian workflow. Yeah. I think it's also because it's just, super huge so we would need to merge ppls rvs pandas stuff like that to to integrate a, and make a whole package called bayesian workflow that'd be nice but practically that'd be hard from what i see for instance like we split up rvs from pymc because it, it was becoming too huge and actually distracting for the pymc team to have to take care of that part of the workflow. Yeah, but I think integration is useful. Yeah, definitely. And then that's something we try to do is to integrate really well with the different PPLs. So trying to to make all these integrate almost seamlessly with PyMC, almost seamlessly with Stan, etc. Yeah. And we definitely talk a lot and, and a lot of RV's devs are also PyMC devs or Stan devs. So that, that helps a lot. 
Okay, uh, Florian, uh, we are out of time. I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you've got a big day ahead of you. So let me ask you the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. And since you are a long time listener, I think you know what you're in, what's waiting you. Uh, so first one is if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Yeah, good one. I think I would really look at the um, at the pipelines. I think there's a lot of discussion in statistics about what is a theoretically what is theoretically a good method. And now I come back to this problem that I just observe people in practice with a limited knowledge about statistics and I have to run their data analysis. And I'm somewhat concerned that we're forgetting among these theoretical problems, which is the best method, that we don't know what are the mistakes people are actually doing in practice and how how could they be avoided. So I think if I would have unlimited time, I think what I would like to do is to run kind of many analyst projects where you get the same data and many people analyze them. but but do this with interventions, like have people being taught differently in statistics, tell them to run different analysis strategies and really find out empirically, not theoretically, how people best learn from data. I think this would be super interesting, hmm. but uh, very resource intensive as well. That's <laughs> the reason why I wouldn't do it if I had limited resources. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? I have no idea. I was prepared for this question. <laughs> and I have to say, well, I settled in the end for Humboldt because I think it would be interesting to hear his stories about his travels and all that. But um, I mean, there's many people that I, that I respect and that I find interesting, but this dinner this dinner situation, I just, uh, <laughs> I didn't find anyone that has said like, this is the person I want to be hmm. on dinner with. I see. Is it because maybe you don't like dinners? Do you prefer lunch? We can change the question to a lunch or a breakfast if you want. <laughs> maybe. I think I'm not a big fan of people on monuments. Mm -hmm. And I've sometimes also found that uh, it's kind of disappointing when you think, oh, this is the greatest, the greatest scientist ever. And then you have a conversation that is very trivial or, mm -hmm. you know, you don't click. So I don't know. I like to have dinner with people I click with mm -hmm. and that's very unpredictable. Yeah. So it seems to me that you should do a lot of dinners with great scientific minds and see. I should just go through all of them. Vielen Dank, Florian. That was really great to, to hear about everything you do like this. You've got a, a very interesting path from physics to ecology to Bayesian stats to open source development. So really it's great to, to hear from you and, and learn about all that. Thanks a lot for doing open source development. That's really something, of course, I always enjoy when, when people do and that's really valuable. So thanks a lot for being part of this community. And as usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Florian, for taking the time and being on this show. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It was great to be here. Yeah, you bet. And keep spreading stat gospel in the ecological world. I will. <laughs> okay, uh, see you, Florian. See you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good baby. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.